Hello, my name is Katie Sando and welcome to the Marketing Forum podcast, where we learn about the professional world of brilliant marketers, communicators and creatives. Simon Minchin is a creative director and a founding partner of Minchin and Grimshaw. He worked at Ogilvy and Mather in the 90s and Saatchi and Saatchi in South Africa and McCann Korea before coming back to Cornwall and turning freelance. I quiz him on how he approaches creative projects, some of the advertising campaigns he's worked on for global brands and how he sells ideas into clients. He also tells us a little bit about his new book. I hope you enjoy listening and I hope you get some great tips from him. Welcome to the Marketing Forum podcast, Mr. Simon Minchin. Um, Thank you, Katie. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, For those of you that aren't familiar with your work, (laughs) um, those two people out there. Uh, No, 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 no. (laughs) (laughs) No, that was was the opposite to what I was thinking. Um, As they they said in Sundance Kid, who are these guys? Yeah, go on. um, So you now um, work as a creative director. Um, but you had you started off with a background in in large agency working in creative, didn't you? Yes. Can I you did. tell us a bit about because you were um, you were at Saatchi, and before that you were uh, you were in another big agency. <laughs> Shall I do you want to quickly run through my resume of agencies that you never heard of and are now folded and disappeared? Well, I don't think that's true of all of them. Um, Not all of them, <laughs> but surprisingly. I was actually, you know, on LinkedIn, you can put a little logo next to your previous employment. <laughs> yeah. Quite a lot of them don't have little logos to put. They're all like, oh. I don't know, something happened there. Yeah. Bob took all the money and went to Venezuela. Um, yes. So tell us, tell us where you were and what you were doing. <laughs> well, okay. So I know you don't want chapter and verse, but I think it's quite interesting. Originally, I was brought up in Cornwall. Oh. I don't know. I was born in Derbyshire, but I was brought up down here, and I went to what was at the time Camborne Technical College, and you know the tower block? That was the old art block. It was known as, well, it was known as the art block, uh, <laughs> and I studied graphic design there, and then got my little spotted handkerchief together and went up to London to try and get a job, which oddly I succeeded in doing. Um, <coughs> So I, st- I was very lucky. I started an agency called FCO, which stands for French Cruttenden Osborne. They were what they called at the time a boutique agency, which meant we had lots of good people, lots of good ideas, and relatively little money. Um, in some ways, that was quite nice. And <sighs> Richard French, who was the chairman, um, took a shine to me and called me student. And... He was supposed to go on little student placements. Obviously, coming from Cornwall, the digital peninsula, I thought, well, I need to, you know, get my footsteps in in London. Um, So I was keen to do lots of placements, and Richard French was keen for me just to do the one. And eventually, I stayed there. And so the first ad that I ever did was for a client that the agency had just won, which was Nike. Um, and it was the first ad I ever did, and it was the first ad Nike ever ran commercially in the UK. Um, and obviously, it's been downhill from then on. <laughs> How could it not be? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, I know. Bummer. Huh? Um, but, <sighs> yeah, um, it, it was a great little agency. It was a uh, creative hot shop, as they used to be called, and we did lots of good stuff. And... At the time, the sort of perceived career advice was move around, get lots of experience, work here, there, and everywhere. Um, eh, whether that was the right thing to do or not, but that was the, what I did. Um, I went to work at Bartle Bogle Hegarty. Um, I should imagine quite a lot of people heard of John Hegarty and hopefully heard of BBH, which was incredible. Um, I worked at Low Howard Spink, which was probably the best big really big agency in town being really big and being really creative was difficult a difficult double act to pull off so the bigger places tended to be a bit less known for creativity and the smaller places blah 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 um and then around about my 30th birthday i went to work at ogilvy um and that was my first board level position 
and was a creative group head and creative director on Guinness and Shell and mm-hmm. some financial stuff. So, um, so, yeah, so that kept me occupied for quite a long time. It would? Is that, yeah, it would. Is this, is this over-egging the detail? No, this is perfect. Is it? I want more. Give me more. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so... <sighs> So then what I really had a love for was television um, and had a big headedness for to think that I could direct. And it was the thing to do. So I was like, oh, have you heard Colin's gone to direct? So I was like, well, I better do that then. Um, so I spent a couple of years directing commercials, which is the job from heaven when you're working and the job from hell when you're not. Um, I just loved it. It was fantastic, all that stuff flying around you lights and cameras and actors and um yeah it it was it was really a a very lucky thing that i could do for a few years but it was a very overtraded market and perhaps i wasn't as good as i thought it was i don't know um after a while i discovered that i was earning enough to live but not you know not i wasn't busy enough um so I looked around at other opportunities and very strangely, uh, executive creative director of Saatchi and Saatchi in South Africa came up. Um, and I went, huh, well, obviously I'm not doing that. Um, and a friend of mine at the time said, you do know it's okay to eat South African apples now? There's this guy called Nelson Mandela and he says it's all right. I was like, oh, okay, quick it, let's go. Um, so I duly did and spent a few years being creative director in of Saatchi in South Africa at a, let's call it a very interesting time. Um, yeah. And uh, that, was, that was good, but in some ways I could see where the place was going and I didn't want to end up being stuck there. I, I've got a lot of mates who still live out there and that's not a very nice thing to say, but the political situation and the economic situation and it was, it was just not working out for me. Um, so weirdly, I went to join McCann Erickson and be creative director of their agency in Seoul in South Korea, which was by far the strangest thing I've ever done. I still can't quite work out why I did it. Um, it was an incredible, but it, yeah, go on. When you say strange, you mean they're in the sense of the work or the place at the time? Everything, everything. Um, it, it, I mean, it, it, there were some lovely people. It's, it, it's some amazing stuff. Um, but, you know, back in the day, I used to travel quite a lot for work. I used to travel a bit for, for entertainment. And so you sort of got used to the fact that the world, yeah, well, it's mostly the same. It's mostly similar, isn't it? Broadly similar. That's what J. Arthur Dent would have written, not, not mostly harmless. Um, and then you get to a place like Korea and you go, oh, no, it isn't. <laughs> no, every single thing is deeply, deeply different. And that was uh i guess a pretty amazing experience um and i don't regret that i did it and uh and i just couldn't do it anymore and at that point life intervened and i came back to cornwall and have been living the dream ever since (laughs) (laughs) let's not sell that dream just yet um okay so i'm interested in a number of things that you've talked about good um luckily or else here endeth the podcast let me make notes <laughs> so what i suppose so you when you were cri- a few points so when you weren't into film directing was that mm. self employed that's like a hmrc5 question <laughs> um did you uh, have your was- own computer or were you using (laughs) computers have barely been heard of i know yeah sorry i mean there was a man who did digital editing down in soho but no one had ever met him um (laughs) was i self-employed uh yes i guess i was i mean i i worked for a production company company called spring hill fanthorpe um they had me on a retainer but then fundamentally i would my income came from shoot fees. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I got quite a lot of shoot fees. 
but that was for the day you're actually shooting and then the po the pre and post production work you sort of gave them um but effectively that that you were recompensed out of your shoot days otherwise you were it, anyway yes it becomes overly complicated but yeah. yes why did yeah. you ask just because you said that um you know you know how good you are is relating to is when you're an employee if you're not very good or you're not um if you're not getting loads of work through that's kind of their problem more than your problem whereas when you're so that's why I asked just because of the way you framed it Curiosity. yeah no no sure I think I mean there are some production companies were better better at selling the directors than others some production companies came from very much a production background so if you'd got the job they would put it together with everything you needed and fantastic and brilliant and cool others were perhaps less good at that, but were great at lunching and whining and dining and going, oh, Simon's discovered an amazing new way of moving the camera. It's, you've just got to use it, darling. Got to. It's perfect. Your Rice Krispies commercial. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have one of those. I had a, yeah, I guess he can do it. I think he knows about Rice Krispies. He's yeah. all right. <laughs> He's eaten those before. Um, eaten those before. Right. So what I really want to ask you about, what my, my great interest in your experience is around the creative process. Mm -hmm. So tell me, so when you first went into an agency and when you're working in these sort of smaller creative agencies, what does that creative process look like? So Nike, new client, they're saying, we, what, are, what are they saying we want and how are you responding to it? Um, well, you pick a weird one with Nike because of Nike because they were and are an incredible client. Um, there were three guys who set the thing up. There was the bloke who made sports shoes out with a waffle iron, the money man, um, and a guy called Rob Strasser, who was an ex-American football player and the best client in the world ever. Um, he just was. He was just. He just got it, and he appreciated the fact that we wanted to do good work for him, and he wanted to help us do good work for him. Um, <laughs> and he was larger than life typically for an American. Um, I hope no Americans are watching. Um, and he, you know, he'd come in and the, the, agent, the client would come in, Rob would come in and the agency would present the work and he'd go, gee, is this everything? Is this everything you got am done? Is, this every, is there anything in that bin? I want to see it's in the bin. I know you throw it away, but I might like it. I want to see that. What's on his wall? Can I look at this? Can I go in here and look at this? And he was just like, a, a, just an amazing person with no... No side. There was, there was. He wasn't doing that to big himself up or do us down. Or he just wanted the best possible stuff. Um, but you ask, what was? So yeah, you say, what's the client? What are the clients like? Um, and obviously, this is all back in the day, right? So this is what seventy nine, eighty to. 15, 20 years on. Um, it is my understanding that the advertising world is a very different place now. Um, so this is, to some extent, tales from the crypt, tales from sort of the heyday, sort of the golden age. I'm not because I was in it by any strange means, but if you ever look at the best, the books of the best advertising ever, it was mostly from that period. Mm -hmm. A few little things, Bill Burnback and VW and stuff from just before. Some early David Abbott, but then there was a lot of people who were trying to do good work, and we all sort of understood what that meant. Interestingly, there were very few uh, colleges teaching advertising, so people weren't taught it. They kept the writers. I mean, I um, worked in Ogilvy. Um, oh no, and the, uh, Salman Rushdie was a copywriter at Ogilvy. Who hey, way? Uh, Anyway, I didn't know uh, that. Yeah, yeah. Salman Rushdie was a copywriter at Ogilvy. And Agatha Christie wrote a book, a story called Murder Must Advertise. And she wrote that because she was a copywriter at Ogilvy as well. Um, <laughs> that, you know, people came from, the writers came from journalism, from, from PR sometimes. Uh, they were failed authors. They were successful authors waiting to be successful. The art directors 
well, I suppose predominantly people like me with a, with a graphic design background, but no one had been taught advertising. So it's like, how do you do it? It's like, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine, man. You know, you do it your way. It's fine. I'll tell you if you're doing it wrong, but, but, but carry on. So that was really quite an incredible mm. time to be around. And interestingly, we'll perhaps touch on this a bit more as we go on. I think, <coughs> I used to think, and, I, and I've thought more while I've been thinking about this, are the similarities between the advertising creative agencies as they were and sort of tech, software-y, tech-y, the way they work. Um, I don't know whether it's true, but I have been told that some sort of tech companies would rather employ somebody who hadn't been taught because if they've been taught, if yeah. they've got a degree in it, <coughs> they know where the business, where the industry was four or five years ago. Um, you see what I mean? Yeah, rather, than, rather than being at the sort of cutting edge of Hi, things now. Um... My instinct went from when you talk around the fact that what you've got is a bunch of like really creative people trying to tackle a problem is that you end up with a really creative solution as opposed to some kind of copy and paste um, or uh, textbook approach. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I think a lot of the way that, that, that we worked was very agile. Mm. Um, it really was. And, it, you know, it, you, could, you could put a presentation together if you wanted to. Please don't. Um, that, that, that drew comparisons because we would have, you know, quick stand up meetings. We would have people working together relatively equally to, to solve one problem. Um, lots of stuff. It was just, no one ever went away and said, this is how you did it. That style of working just evolved out of the process. And I think to some extent at that time, um, the advertising industry and Hollywood were the only two industries that were commercializing creativity mm. and therefore had to have a system to do it. Some sort, even if it was a system, <coughs> pardon me, that they ignored, you know, they had to know what the rule was before they broke it. Um, and so that, that was, that was an interesting thing to, to observe. So when, um, when businesses came to your clients came to you, how high up is the request? So what I mean by that is, are they asking or were they? I know, like you say, I completely appreciate this is back in the day, but, you know, it's an interesting, it's where it yeah. all evolves from. Yeah. Um, so were they saying, you know, we've got X, Y, Z product. We're wanting to, uh, you know, how clear is the brief? Or was it literally just like, you know, oh, we're thinking about trying to do some TV? Um, no, I mean, I mean it, it would depend, but. Back in the day, there was money sloshing about. The reason there was money sloshing about <coughs> was because media was so expensive. Right. Media was finite and media was scarce, therefore media was expensive. There was only so much TV time. There was only so much, so many pages in the papers. So a client's media was a lot of money. The only thing they could do to maximize the return on that resource was have creative that they believed would be a money multiplier. So it was an idea that would get more value from that 30 second commercial or from that print ad than if it was another idea. And so that money is sloshing about jobs for the boys. So there would be a lot of clients. There would be a senior client, two middleweight clients, eight lower middleweight clients, six junior clients, and they would all be matched off by people in the account handling department of the agency. Um, so with all those people thinking about it, they, you know, you'd, you'd come with fairly precise stuff. What tended to happen is an agency would pitch for a piece of business. They would win the piece of business. There was a period of like, oh, let's get to know each other. What's the brand stand for? What do we need to know about this? What, what, you know, what's in the guard book? So what's been done before. Um, but then that machine would go, right, we need to promote baked beans in spring because there's, a, there's an opportunity for people to eat baked beans in spring. Whatever, you know what I mean. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, by the time it came to the creative department, the brief was, was pretty precise. Okay. 
And then your job would be to write, how are we going to deliver this? Um, it depends what you mean by that. Um, so would you come up with a bunch of different ideas? Well, and do, where are you picking me up in my career? Am I working in the creative department or is the creative department working for me? Um, yeah, I mean, people worked in teams, so art director and copywriter, words and pictures. Um, they were in an office because it's nice to have a bit of quiet and a bit of privacy, and the door was open because you want to invite people to come in and see what you're doing. So the brief turns up. Um, the brief was seen to be very, very, very important. Um, so agencies were very proud about their their briefing process, about the briefing form, about what you put on a brief, what you didn't, um, what restrictions it, it gave the creative team, and what freedoms it gave the creative team. So the, the getting a good brief, <coughs> pardon me, um, was seen to be really important because it is really important. Then that goes through to a or many creative teams and we generate ideas. Mm. And it was commonly the common practice that you would work with big layout pads, big markers, um, lots of cell tape. And you, the idea was, it was sort of, I want to see the off. I, I want to see no office wall. I want to see everything covered in ideas. And that would take a bit of time. I mean, you'd get, what, maybe a couple of weeks to work on a on an ad, um, maybe three weeks if it was going to be a new campaign. You would, you had other jobs to be that you were working on at the same time, so that wasn't always two solid weeks. But you were given plenty of time, um, and you were given plenty of time to to put some ideas down, put them on the wall, to go right. I've done that. To go away, to not think about it, to go to the pub. Um, to have a break from it, to come back, and go, oh yeah, I remember that. I like that one, and to repeat the process, and getting to a good creative solution of anything is very often a process of generating an idea, going away from it, come back, edit it, then generate again, go away, come back and edit it. And we had the time to do that, <coughs> um, and that process would be managed by. A creative director who would come in and go, okay, it might be me, or maybe someone was coming in but earlier, would be someone coming and talking to me. They go, well, you know, that, that, that sort of idea, the ideas that you've got there, they're working. Um, don't like this so much, maybe leave that. So you just get a little, a little steer, a little movement here and there, a um, bit of guidance and someone's opinion. Um, but it was generally an opinion that was valued. When you got to the point where it was you as creative director working with the, the teams, are you <coughs> yeah. involved as a creative director and then representing that back to the client? Is that within your remit? It would depend on the client agency relationship. Um, okay. Quite often, yes, but not always. Um, some clients like to see some creative people and some didn't. Some creative people, it was nice to show them, and some, not so much. Yes. Um, <laughs> no, Bob, no, it's fine. No, he does like your idea, Bob, yes. Um, oh, no, I can imagine. <laughs> why didn't you do mine? <laughs> um, you know, and, and also, uh, uh, you know, those it, 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 it was serious business. I mean, you were dealing with some some big... FTSE 100 companies, you were quite often dealing with the chairman or the MD. Um, you kind of wanted people who wouldn't dribble at the table. Um, a message that still stands today. So I believe, so I believe, yes. Um, it's good to see that some things haven't changed. Uh, but uh, I think one of the things, I used to like presenting creative work and I used to think I was quite good at it. Um, I was quite successful at it, so I guess I was. And I, I think one of the things, again, I was thinking about this in regards to the podcast, do you think? People aren't terribly good at judging creative work. Mm. So, you know, I'd like, I want a poster for the airport. Oh, that, mm, 
I don't know. I want a TV commercial. It's certainly when you get to TV, for anybody, the, the, there's a transition between a, a, a page of typing and 60 seconds of sound and music and light and industrial post-production. It's difficult to do that. What people are good at is assessing how committed and how convinced the person who's presenting the work is. Right. Right? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay. It's all um, delivery. Well, yeah, you know, if you go, I've done this. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> I could do both of those. But if you go... So uh, really, are you? I mean, are you sure? I mean, it's oh, it's just too good. It, <laughs> hey, look, <laughs> no, honestly, hey, this is on the table just for today. We're not doing it. If you don't buy it today, we're not doing it. Okay. But okay, so give us some tips around this. So I get what you're saying <laughs> about in terms of the, um, you know, obviously getting the buy-in through your behaviour, but so. I completely agree that it's very difficult to sell whether or not you're talking about logos and its brand or whether or not you're talking about visuals, photography, whatever it is. My experience is people go straight to whether or not they like it. Mm. And in that the should name, be a material. It's completely irrelevant. I have no interest, unless you're the target audience, whether or not you actually like it. So do you, yeah. how do you find, do you have a good way of trying to get that across or... Because, well, yes, because that, I mean, that's, you know, I'm a bit obsessed about brands and, and defining the problem. <laughs> so my enthusiasm for, for, for brand definitions and, and brand management is to stop people using their own personal aesthetic judgment and go, oh, I like blue. Hey, you've done it in blue. That's great. Let's have the blue one. <laughs> It's not. Oh my god! It's uh, so common, though. Oh, totally. So that process has to begin before that. So you know, if you if you're doing some sort of a new piece of branding, a new brand uh, management for a, for a company, then we say, well, this is what it has to say. Okay, so you want to make strong relationships with your clients to produce effective work that come, has mm. business outcomes. You are flexible, you are opinionated and you are principled. So when it comes to assessing the work, you remind them of that and go, look, I kind of don't care whether you like it or not. Mm. Does it say this? Yeah. And uh, one of the things that, that I, became quite good at um is you have to you frame it from the client's point of view so you know what do you what do we want this to achieve we want this to make your business more famous to make your business fee seem more organic more friendly more in tune with single mums more appropriate for old age pensioners whatever that is um that's the purpose of whatever we're looking at today mm. not to be a nice t-shirt or go oh yeah my, my, my i showed this to my wife and she loves it i say yeah i'm so pleased or i showed it to my husband and he loves it oh i'm even more pleased um so yeah i mean that that that, that idea that idea has a business outcome mm. And that's what it should be judged against. Yeah, got you. So, so it's creating you, you, the framework before you're in the room. Yeah. So so when you present, look like you like what you're about to present. Remind people what it's meant to do. Mm. Um, and then present it through the framework of, of doing the do, of, of, <clears throat> of demonstrating why you believe it will achieve that task that's been set mm. for it. I just think it, particularly in <clears throat> SMEs, it's one of the hardest things because in the main, when it comes to anything creative, if you're trying to get a sign-off, you're not getting sign-off from somebody that's a creative. 
So, you know, if you're if you're an SME marketer and you're on your own as a marketing manager in a company, mm. if you need to get the managing director's sign off, the chances of the managing director having any kind of creative background is, you know, at best zero mm. and so then I, I the the number of times you then sit in a room and it's like I don't really like like you said the blue example you know we re- we really like green because green for us you know it reflects what we do and you just think like no it doesn't um yeah good good advice therefore because I think that's <laughs> going to be something that most people listening are going to resonate with in from an SME or micro perspective it's just how the hell do you get this past someone and it's difficult and I think it's horses for courses I mean depending on the sort of business you know I can think of businesses that either mentioned Grimshaw has talked to or worked with <laughs> Well, to some extent, those rules don't apply. Yeah. So know what the rules are and then decide to break them. Go, you go, actually, you know, this business is, it exists because Sarah and Bob just had a dream and they brought it to life. And we, that was it. I wish I could remember what they're called now. Um, we went down to see a wonderful couple down towards Penzance who made seats and chairs and tents out of reclaimed amazing old bits of reclaimed fabric uh i can't remember what on earth they were called and we went mr grimshaw and i went down we spent the day with them and we said look there's nothing that we can add you are you are perfect you are the living embodiment of two people who are really nice and likable and have got this really nice and likable great idea and you really nice and likably did it and oddly you know you're now on the cover of vogue because the man who's the editor of vogue thought they are so nice and likable we'll put their tent on the cover it's like well yeah just do that um so i think in 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 b2c things sometimes what that job is to do is to promote and translate a very personal vision um i think in b2b that's always never the case mm. there's always there's always a job or a, a, a piece of information to be transmitted a fact to be shared uh, yes it's an it's an interesting space but it's a good one hmm. i'm um on that note, I guess I want to speak to you more a little bit about that tension between client creative. So I said to you, do you actually think there is a tension or is that something that I have just kind of made up or other people as well, maybe made up? I don't think there should be a tension between when you say client and creative, what, are we talking about a, a a personality problem or a point of view problem or a what do you mean <clears throat> i guess what i mean in that sense is um so I, clients can be challenging i think when it comes to <laughs> to certain things and i imagine that you've experienced that less in corporate agency style work you it was worse then same all companies are all all companies are run badly just in different ways. Okay. Right? And all companies are run really well just in different ways. The 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 fact that uh, I don't know, that I'm 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 talking to Mr. Guinness or Mr. Microsoft or Mr. Toyota or Mr. whatever doesn't make him necessarily just gives him more money. Is basically yeah. what it gives him. Yes, he's probably been fished out of a bigger pool, and yes, in theory, he should be a better client. Um, but it's a theory. Okay. I think I, I think I've met people since I've been working in Cornwall who have been fantastic clients. Absolutely brilliant. Um, the fact that they've got smaller budgets, well, you know that that that's life. Some people can't 
spend as much when they go shopping. I guess the reason I would assume that it's uh, less of a tension in a, in a big corporate or an agency environment is because you've, you're likely to be dealing with, um, with other creatives for a start but also you've got more people around you that can help you deliver sort of different angles. So you've got, you know, often, I don't know, my experience can be around the fact that sometimes that commercial piece gets lost, you know, as in like, why are we, why are we doing this? And that piece gets forgotten in the middle. Mm. Um, and I would imagine that in SMEs that can be worse. Um, yes, but, maybe. but not if that's your, not if that's your experience. <sighs> I think, you know, my experience, all clients pretty much get the fact that they're in this to improve, benefit, promote their business. They just see how that might take place in slightly different ways mm -hmm. and might have a different feeling or a different opinion about how that might happen. <laughs> I think with SMEs, there's a lot of, and I think quite possibly with, with advertising in general now, we used to do a lot of research, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of research. We, there were, you know, a good planner, um, which I wrote an interesting article on LinkedIn a week or two ago. You might want to read it. I might. Um, <laughs> you might not. Though. Um, I mean, a good, a good planner could, could pretty much impersonate a, a, a potential customer or somebody from the target audience. We knew what they wanted to hear and we knew what they mot would motivate them and we knew what they felt about the company the brand that we were working on and then when we'd done some ads some rough ideas quite often we asked them what they thought of them mm. um research no one does research why don't you do research when no one does it well they do desk research i do that it's called staring at the computer for three hours and going i have no idea mate um so when you guys used to do research, you used to like go out and about and actually try and find these customers. Oh, I mean, research companies would find them for you. Mm. Um, and, you know, people would spend a lot of money on <coughs> focus groups, on uh, all sorts. Um, and the magic research bullet was chased with enthusiasm and vast amounts of pennies was poured at it. Mm. Um, but for a reason, you know, I mean, if if you want to advertise to a particular group of people, find out what makes them tick, find out what they're interested in, find out what they want to know. What do they think of you at the moment? And ask that because actually the more specific they are about why they hate you, the more useful that is. Mm. But you find, you know, when you do push someone to do some research, they pretty much try and couch it on a, how much do you actually love us? On a scale of one to 10, would it be, well, obviously not one, but nine or 10? Um, <laughs> you know, and you're, you're going, well, why do, yeah, but why do they, why do they hate you? Why do you, why do you disappoint them? Why do they not put all their business with you? Oh, I don't think we need to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we do. That's the bit we do need to know. Um, yeah. And, the, you know, the, the, the whole thing, I read a uh, lovely book. You should yeah, you get this a chap called David Trott. Dave Trott uh, was creative director of an agency called GGT, Gold Greenlee's Trott, and was one of the gurus of 80s advertising. And he has written a book called One Plus One Equals Three, which is all about creativity. And it's really good. And in there, he, he talks a little bit about stuff. He says, to be honest with you, the majority of <coughs> creative problems are best solved by the application of large amounts of common sense. And that does it. And, and, and the, the, the job of creative thinking is very often to make things as simple as possible. Not as complicated as possible. Make it as simple as possible. Unfortunately, it's difficult to charge money for common sense, and people aren't terribly impressed when you make it simple. So the industry kind of specializes that common sense and calls it 
blue chain thinking. That's what we use. Um, or they say that, <coughs> yes, they can solve your problem, Mr. Client, but it's an incredibly complicated problem and will need an incredibly complicated solution. Whereas actually, it's, no, it isn't. And no, it doesn't. Mm. And that that's always been the case. You know, you, it is often common sense. It is often quite simple. And you can't sell that. But it's hard. Mm. Yeah, it's and it, whether you jazz it up a little bit or zhuzh it up a lot or turn it into some some sort of proprietary blue sky agility methodology zam, uh, it, it's it's still the same. Yeah, I, I've patented blue sky methodology zam by the way. So if you're smiling because you think I'm going to tell people that, <laughs> I just registered the domain while you were doing that. Yeah, um, yeah, quite... <laughs> no, yeah, you're absolutely right, aren't you? It's like convolution of but that's where jargon comes from isn't it it comes from this idea of we need to make ourselves sound way more complicated and intelligent than we really are around this mm. um, um mm -hmm. tell me about mm -hmm. if possible mm -hmm. tell me about some campaigns that you really loved that you did or even that you didn't <laughs> um or that I did. Well, I'm interested in some of the ones that you, I know um, they were a while ago. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. Sorry. Um, but, um, no, I no, here's, an, here's another thing. Here's a flipping bet noir. Do you know what, you know WPP, who's the biggest advertising marketing group in the world? Yes. Do you know what their average age of employee is? 22. Ooh, you're so far beyond the curve you need to row yourself back a bit um 29 really but for some bizarre reason advertising is the one or there's no respect for experience there is that yeah. there's you know somebody who's new um and it, it, that's been ingrained in the things for years when i was when I was directing and I hadn't done a lot and I've been involved in TV an awful lot from a creative director's point of view, but I hadn't done a lot of the director, but I'd done stuff and we pitched for a job and they said, we want somebody who's never done it before. Simon's done three or four commercials and they're really good, but we want somebody who's never done it before. Wouldn't that be great? And is that the criteria? Is that the only criteria you're looking at? They, um, we want to like them as well, but yeah, pretty much. So, well, well, God, how bizarre. What it, can you do? You know, I don't know if it's unique to advertising. I saw um, a few years ago now, um, there was a chap that was talking about the fact that he has a similar experience in PR. You know, he spent life doing tr probably therefore traditional PR, but mm. then suddenly agencies want, aren't interested in that type of experience, don't really see it as transferable. Um, and it is... Um, it is odd. It is. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think the the business went off looking for went off looking for creativity, no matter what, and so to some extent, they stepped away from creativity that was designed to answer a specific and well-defined problem and have creativity that was just like whoa where did that come from no one's ever done that before yeah. <laughs> um and so people started to talk about the shock of the new well what's new well what's new is caroline and jackie and bob who came out of college last week and are sitting in the office down the end and have never done anything, not obviously like rabbits in the headlights. Our plan, okay, our plan, get this, is to put them in charge. <laughs> How'd you like them apples? It's and, like the um, Robinson's fruit juice advert, but, um, but now real. Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, so I've sidetracked myself now. I can't remember what I was on about. I, I can get, I can understand why um, when there's a, you know new channels and new media, 
why therefore you would need people with like a native understanding of that stuff but equally like you say there's not um that doesn't mean that they have to be in charge of the entire entire process no but you know advertising marketing to some extent lesser you remember those old the tin two tin cans and a piece of string yeah that's what it is there's a there's a person with a message at one end and a person who wants to receive the message at the other end the tin cans and the piece of string are immaterial we have convinced ourselves that the important things is probably the string because you need to understand string theory and actually oh, yeah. actually the tin cans you know well these are the latest these are tin can version 19.0 mm. and you can't actually access them on safari you have to be on um a different Where? browser and uh, it, yeah. do you remember the two people do you remember the person talking to the person listening yeah that's a minute that's, let's not worry about that mm. um, that's fine um but wouldn't it be nice if the two were given equal weight at yeah. least um and i don't think they always are sometimes they are uh, you yeah, know it's fine and that proliferation of media channels is a great thing it's empowered businesses of almost any size to in some way emulate what the most successful businesses in their industry sector do because where the media has a very often a very low cost in digital media you can afford to do stuff even if you can't afford you know you can afford to have a facebook page for your business even if you're not <coughs> using targeted advertising you can do updates you can do stuff you can you can send your message out into the ether well, you didn't used to be able to do that. No. You know, that was called maybe 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 fly posting. Mm. Maybe dropping, you know, postcards on people's desks. Mm. So it's done wonders for opportunities for people. Um, people who work in the industry and people who are SMEs or or, or, or bigger. But it would be lovely if the old knowing, the old knowledge, the old principles that applied when people were spending millions and millions and millions of pounds on a TV campaign were applied to, to what people were doing with small, much smaller budgets because that idea of good, good creative work being a money multiplier still holds true. Mm. You know, you can see a little advert on Facebook and it's rubbish and you go, oh, rubbish. You can see something that happens to catch your eye and you go oh hey oh no i said i wouldn't click on that didn't i damn i have done that <laughs> uh, that it's um i watched a webinar the other day from ogilvy that was talking about the psychology of adver adverts and advertising and it was it was really interesting and they do like this Is it from rory oh, I can't Sutherland. maybe i can't remember who was um there was four um people talking Four? Yeah, there was four people talking. Um, two of them were um, Ogilvy and two of them were um, marketing um, communications agencies. But um, it was really interesting because you talk about the shock of, shock of the new and effectively they were kind of dissecting that because they were talking about like, so, you know, they, they've literally done this incredible research into the psychology of what makes good advert. And um, that actually that you need uh, the cognitive <laughs> response it was in depth, but like the cognitive response around it, you know, like shock of the news, all very well and good, but actually it's not actually going to sustain the response that you need and or want from the advert necessarily. Sure. Um, so um, it was, it's very, I mean, that's the problem with anything unsustainable really, isn't it? Is that, it, let's say your approach was shock of the new in the long term. Well, that's a, cliff edge coming mm. up pretty quickly sure um you're not really building a brand through that either are you no i mean <clears throat> yeah what <clears throat> pardon me <clears throat> we used to what people used to talk about was rewarded comprehension so the classic formula for 
a piece of advertising was there would be a picture of something and some words about it. And at one level, superficial level, the two didn't go together. But, oh, good Lord, I get it. And your brain, in comprehending what that message actually was, gives itself a little reward. It goes, oh, I was good at that. That's cool. I get it. What a great ad. And it sticks in your mind, and it becomes something that you've worked for a little bit. I mean, yeah. not very much, but a little bit. You know, do you remember Ken Livingston? Mm-hmm. Right. So one of you talked a bit earlier about what some of the stuff that you did. We did a, a 48-sheet poster for the London Marathon, for Nike. 48-sheet poster, big running shoe, and it said, Dear Ken, this is the way to run London. Oof. Oof. Who's the daddy? Who's the daddy? <laughs> I wrote that with my own pen. And I won a lot of awards for it, bizarrely. Some words and a shoe. But that's rewarded that's rewarded comprehension. It's not a flipping, you know, degree level thesis, but it is like, oh yeah, okay, I like that. Yeah. Um Oh man, like that's when brands could be political in a completely different way. Yeah, you know, we we hmm, we had fun. We did stuff. Yes, mm. it was good. Um, yeah. Tell me about others. <laughs> um, I didn't do all of the Rutger Hauer Guinness commercials, but I did all the good ones. <laughs> um, and that was great. And, and in that... <laughs> Do you remember them? I remember some of the early Guinness ones, but not all of them. All right. Um, I did five. I did three seasons, and one um, was directed, one, one group set of five commercials was directed by Ridley Scott, and it was the first and subsequently only time that Rutger and Ridley worked together after Blade Runner. Right. That was interesting because they both thought they'd made the other one famous. Right. <laughs> it's like, guys, guys, can we squabble later? Just show a picture of my beer, please. Is that all right? Um, that was good. I mean, that was sort of fantasy land. I mean, we, we you know, spending two or three weeks in LA with hanging out with Ridley, shooting weirdly pseudo meaningful commercials with a famous Dutch actor. Um, Mm. Guinness, I think, must have been Guinness created almost um, through their advertising in those. Well, I guess from the beginning is how it's perceived from an from an outside perspective. But they created an almost, um, you know, people wanted to see the adverts just because they wanted to see what Guinness were creating next. People used to say that the best thing on TV were the commercial breaks, and it was true. Uh, they were easily the most expensive i mean cost per second of screen time commercials were a hundred times more expensive than the programs that they were going in between Mm. um you could do stuff that some of the hollywood directors were like oh i wish i could afford to do that mr Mm. jealousy um It it was a time of opportunity. And I think, you know, very similar, if you look at the the, the tech, the, the world of the geek, the geek shall inherit the earth, you know, that, that focus on technology and the, the digital space at the moment, that's where all the opportunities lie. That's where all the fun is. That's where uh, there are things, you know, no one's ever done this before. Well, hey, let's do it, but then we should do it. Mm. Um, yeah, that. Did you ever read the book The Attention Merchants? No. I'm going to send you a link to it. That is, it's really interesting because it talks about advertising when it was invented, essentially. Um, and you know, imagine a time when there was a newspaper, but there was no adverts in it. Um, and um, but it talks about like kind of that evolution and, and like you say, like the boom and. Um, everything that came with that it's scary because they were allowed to basically lie um well yeah 
<laughs> have you read The Hidden Persuaders? No. That's quite advanced Packard. And that was seen as the sort of the Bible of um, an intelligent, psychological, psychoanalytical approach to advertising. It was just made up. <laughs> they just made it up. Yeah, there's a bit in there about they about subliminal advertising, which everyone was, everyone's terrified about being advertised to in a way that works, but they don't know it. Right. So the idea of subliminal advertising is that you put flash frames into a movie. So just one frame of a desert, a heat haze, uh, parched earth. And that then in the, in the break between the two movies, when the Kiora orange lady came down, she'd be mown down by people demanding Kiora and orange because they'd in this, they'd supplanted, they put in their people's head an idea of thirst and, Never happened, and that was that was quoted as you know people got upset, people raised questions in <laughs> Parliament um, about subliminal advertising. It doesn't exist and it doesn't work. Right, but people said it did, and yeah. so it does, and so people still believe it. Um, Let's not get on to conspiracy theorists. It's not a conspiracy. I mean, I mean, that's not a conspiracy. It's just, <laughs> like back in the day, you could write, you could make stuff up, and everyone, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we like that. <laughs> Talk to me about creative director role. Um, what do you think the role does in general? Now or then, or in between, or what? Well, I guess. So, what do you think it does now? but then compared to what it used to do? Probably the same. It's probably just a, a question of scale. I mean, the way I tend to work at the moment is I work with, sometimes I write copy, sometimes other people write copy. Sometimes I will do a pretty accurate design of something sometimes i'll just go hey you know we'll work with a, a client's in-house design team or a designer of their choice or this that, and the other and and that's how to some extent an art director certainly a creative director works they don't necessarily do the stuff they themselves but they know a man who can and they give that man or woman guidance and advice and direction on how they should go about doing it while at the same time allowing and encouraging them to have their own input okay um it, <laughs> i don't know um if i wasn't doing it i don't know whether the role would exist in the market down here at the moment because because um but you can certainly see that designers in particular like they like having a clear brief and they like being told in a way that they can understand where they've gone wrong and where they've gone right mm. um so i think it's about if I, you know it, and when it when it's working really well then i can be that sort of bridge between client and creative department so I mean, I'm, I'm more able to, can be more able to present creative work that's been done on the client's behalf to the client and have them understand the whys and the wherefores and go, okay, yeah, no, I get that. No, I really like it. That's good. By the same token, if the client has got concerns, I find it relatively easy to transmit them back to the writers or the designers or whatever in ways that doesn't leave them foaming at the mouth and jumping up and down and wanting to squash things. Um, and I guess a creative director would, would does what it says on the tin. Urgh, hate that. Um, give the creativity some direction, probably point it in the right direction. Um, mean that it can perhaps move more quickly because you don't have to, you know, let's do, let's, you know, yeah, we could explore there, but not, there's not much point. And we don't want to go there because they just hate that. So can we keep our attentions focused down here and let's mm. have a look? And, um, and I think it's, it's useful. 
do I think it's useful? Yes, I think I think I, I think I can step back and take a bit of an overview and say this is working, that not so much. Let's concentrate on that. Um, when you were in a larger organisation, like agency side, then was the creative role, creative director role, did that also encompass therefore quite a lot of people management in the sense of you know not just like greasing the creative process, but actually getting people to do stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. very much so. Um, I mean, probably not quite half of it would be stuff that you would be expected to do as a senior member of the board. So looking at the agency's own business, looking at accounts and money and investment and profit and loss and this, that, and the other. Um, the rest of it, and then there would be, you know, a degree of staffing. I mean, I suppose the biggest aid department around was about 40 people, um, which is actually quite a lot. Yeah, right. Um, you know, and you have to kind of <laughs> try and, manage all the little spats that they're having between each other and um and creative people can be well you know a bit <laughs> um but yeah i mean i think this the hardest thing was you you go into someone's office you've you've given them a brief you go into their office you look at what's on the wall you go oh, no that's wrong look yeah give me a second right look and so it, it's much easier to come up with a solution yourself than it is to try and get them to do it. Right. But unfortunately, what you have to do is not come up with a solution yourself. You have to try and get them to do it. Otherwise, they're not going to progress. Um, you're going to end up in a situation where you, me, are doing all the work. So I am the bottleneck, which is causing the problem in this agency because I'm not doing all the work quickly enough. Right. Not a happy place to be, mm. but it's difficult. Uh, you know, to 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 be in a position where you can give advice, you can you can t tell people they're wrong, but hey, it doesn't matter. You know, you found one way of doing it, and that's cool. Let's have a look at some other ways. <laughs> to build that relationship up takes quite a lot of trust, and needs to have quite a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um and don't always have the luxury of that i mean you know ryan lovely ryan um mr mcfarlane and i um get on very well and he'll go do you just want me to do it as you wrote, draw it in the little thing you just i just copy that do i is that the plan you don't really want it to, do i just copy that <coughs> um which of course it never is but uh <laughs> Yeah. I read a um, really interesting I thought it was interesting a quote the other day around the creative process and it said something like people underestimate the importance of persistence in a creative process um, in the sense that you know it's not just um, it was in the context of not just um, you've done something and the creative process is quick but actually often creative can be you know an endurance test to get to the right thing right yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's you know one of the things that we had was time. Mm. There was a lot of time. It was it was accepted that to come up with a good idea, come up with your first ideas quickly, but your best ideas take time. And agencies would battle with clients and say, "No, I know you know I know you wanted it next week, but you can't have it next week. It's going to be next month." Mm. Well, I want it next week. Well. That's not how we do it around here. But agencies would stand their ground yeah. and would produce work that was so good or so effective that clients would eventually go, okay, fine, all right, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. We'll give you the time. Um, I don't think that happens. I think that people say, I want it next week. And people go, well, is Tuesday okay? <laughs> it's like, well, Monday next week was actually what I had in mind. Um but if you're not that keen on working with us in the future, then yeah, sure, Tuesday, fill your boots, mate. Make it the afternoon. See if I care. But the 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 process, as I said, you know, the the, the process of getting to that that good idea after you've got the great brief and you've understood the great brief, you then generate those first ideas. 
you then need to step away from them. You, you need your subconscious to be working through that. And your subconscious does not like to be told when it has to be done it by. Mm. Um, and your subconscious does not like to put a lot of effort into pretend, pretending to work so that people can see that you're still working. Although actually what you need to be doing is not working so that your subconscious can work on it. Um, so you generate and then you edit and you generate and you edit. And actually, within reason, the more times you can go through that generate edit process, probably the better idea you're going to have at the end of the day. Nothing's empiric. I mean, maybe your first one's the best one, but hey. True. Is it the same sort of process you take nowadays with your book writing as well? Yeah. Um, I wish I knew. <laughs> Ah, dear. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, so I have written a book of short stories. You can read them at bedtime, children. Um, that's, not your, that's not your first book, though, is it? What do you mean? Have you written another book? Is that your first one? Uh, well, the, the, the hope the second one is about to be going to the editing process oh um so the second one should be out in a, two or three months um i wrote a book when i was in my 30s that was never published so that doesn't really count but i did write it and it is like yay big it is an airport book from the 80s it's massive unfortunately never published <laughs> yeah that's my first book okay no because i don't know why don't but in my head <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't an insult in my head for some reason i thought it was um your second or third Nietzsche. um so tell me about are you the kind of person that forces yourself to sit down between like eight and eleven and write no, irrespective? no. okay no tell me about your process no, I, uh, all the rules that i know about how to generate creative work I seem to ignore. Um, I try desperately to drag myself back to follow some of them. Um, computers. <clears throat> computers are great for <clears throat> producing an idea. If once you've had the idea, if you want to think creatively, pick up a pencil and a piece of paper and doodle because the, because doodling is about helping your subconscious get stuff out. Yeah. Do I do that when I write? No, I don't. I open a Word document. I write the title of the story. I write by Simon Minchin underneath it. I begin. Jack walked across the floor. Ooh. Where's he going? <laughs> Where is Jack? See Jack walk. Um, oh, man. So, no, and I, I sort of tend to... to to chip away at them and just do it in little bits and i was talking to somebody yesterday and he's like oh you must you must be so thrilled when you're in your flow state <laughs> yes yeah. yes google's oh, flow about? state quite. <laughs> really i've no i've never that the creative just gushing from your fingertips and you're just typing like a fiend oh, nope. no. no 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 um and and, and the, the the worst one that i do and I can't do anything about it, but I'm conscious of the fact that I do it, is that generate an edit. I will write, Jack walked across the room. Hmm. Do we like the fact that he's called Jack? Yes, he's called Jack. Okay, don't change his name now. Across the room. That's a bit prosaic, it's a bit ordinary. Through the room. Just move on to the next sentence. Oh, no. Well, I don't know. I, I think we can get this one a little bit better first. So I don't care. We can come back and do that. Right. So it, it, it's just, and then some, and then at the end of the day, because what I do is um, what they call writing into the dark. So I don't know what's going to happen. Right. Right. I have, I have a bit of an idea, or I think this is probably about X or so whatever, but I don't, or very rarely, know what the plot of the story is going to be so i'm like right 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 jack across the room and the whale fell whale fell on him yeah right apparently 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 
according to Mr. Subconscious here, a whale falls on him, all right? Oh, my god. Just get on with it. (laughs) As the author, you're as surprised as we are. (laughs) Dear God, where'd the whale come from? (laughs) I'm sure he's got to be called Jack, because it's a bit boring. Yeah. Um, But, yeah. Mm. Cool. I mean, um, I love writing, but I don't think I could ever write a book. Right. Because I just... But I, maybe I need to try this writing into the dark thing because I'm always like, do you know what? I just can't come up with the ideas. I'm going to try it. I'll yeah. email you a short story. <laughs> It'll be really short. No, sure. Short stories are good. I mean, I, I, William, my publisher, goes, you're going to, going to write a novel at some point, aren't you? And it's like, mm, maybe. I quite like short stories. Um, and, oh, I don't know. I mean... It's been silverbacks turned a profit. It's not going to make me rich, but it's not. It's proven not to be a vanity thing, a vanity project. Um, it has gone into the black. Um, but I do it for the enjoyment of doing it. I think because um, I'm telling me those stories as well. Yeah, and you know, some of them say, "Yeah, I really like that. It's nice." Do you yeah. think there's any truth in the fact that if you're a creative person, it's going to spill out of you somehow? Yes. Yeah. 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 If, you, if you've if you got a talent or an ability to do something and you don't allow yourself to do it, that's going to have some, some bad repercussions, mm. I think. Yeah. Or rather, it will be much more positive to allow yourself to do it. So last question from me. Mm-hmm. Yes. Do you think, um, back to the creative director stuff, do you think that more SMEs and micros, maybe not micros, it's very difficult for them, but do you think more SMEs should should think about whether or not they need, need to kind of create, a, not create a creative director role in-house because it's just, un, they won't have the budget, but do you think they should be using it more? I do. I think people often have a misconception of what their business is about. Um, Very often, we'll talk talk to a talk to a client, new client, and they will say, "Well, this is what we do," and you go, "Is it?" Mm. I don't think it is actually. Yeah, but it is. We do. Yeah, but and. I think one of the things that I can do is is I can be a sounding board for ideas. Um, I can try and help them make things simple and see it with a bit of clarity. And that's a difficult thing to do, particularly on your own, particularly if it's your own business. Um, you know, I think some of the clients that I'm closest to, <coughs> I quite I sort of chat with them every every week really just for you know what's what's going on um and i think there's a lot of value in that for them Mm. um well i think it's your your what you're hitting on is one of the challenges of being in a in a small medium-sized business in a marketing team you're likely to be on your own and Mm. if marketing we consider to be have at least an element of creative process within it creative for me for me it's very it's very often not a one person you can't do it individ, as an individual you have to have somebody that you can talk to or yeah, um, it's, it's just not going to go anywhere otherwise is it sure <sighs> yeah um you know i i think that what i've always believed and find it quite difficult to get across to people is that those sort of principles that I used and learned back in the eighties are still valid because they were about ideas. They were about what an idea needed to do, that it needed to attract somebody's attention, that it needed to give them a piece of information, that it needed to stimulate a desire, that it needed to drive them to an action. They're all, true for any sort of business um and it's and it's a shame that that more smes 
in the region aren't getting the benefit of that really mm. sure yeah i agree i think we should all for me as well it's about being prepared to collaborate it's about being prepared not to say i delivered this single-handedly <laughs> you know it's being prepared to say you know actually there was like five of us that worked on this project and it's 10 times better exactly because of that exactly i think that's great yeah same Mm -hmm. thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us well i don't know if i've done that much but anyway hope you enjoyed it i very much did (laughs) i have learned it Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. What, so I'm also gonna do... <laughs> no. what I'm also going to do is get you to send me a link to some of the books you mentioned, because okay. I certainly would be interested in reading them, but also I think other people will as well. Yeah, no, the Trotty one's good. Um, cool. yes. And I'm going to send you a link to the, what did I say it was, the Attention Merchants, because mm. that one is absolutely fascinating sure. and terrifying in equal measure. And next time you find yourself on Amazon.com, which is a book-selling <laughs> website, as we all know. Silverback by Simon Minchin. Is it about gorillas? Oh, my God. I, I Sorry. Wrong thing to say. Abort. Abort. <laughs> <laughs> Blah. Cool. Thanks ever so. My pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Marketing Forum podcast. If you are not already, please do like and subscribe. And you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our mailing list to find out more about episodes coming your way soon.